I wonder if you've managed to find bread this week. Supplies are being quickly snatched up, aren't they? Earlier this week, I went to go and buy some bread, and having my own multitude of five children, we need quite a lot of bread unless we go to the shops every other day. My wife, Kaz, had just given me a list of everything that we needed, and it wasn't just the loaves for lunchtime sandwiches, but it was also bread rolls for our tea of hot dogs. I'd gone to the self-scan checkouts uh, and just put free bread items through, and then when I went to put the four through, the red light flashed, saying that I wasn't allowed any more items of bread. The lady on the self-scan checkouts, she said that she couldn't let me buy any more bread. Then the manager came over and I explained that I have five kids to feed, but he said no as well. Even the lady behind me in the queue, she offered to buy the bread for me, but the staff said she wasn't even allowed to do that. So I stuck with my free items, and then went to the garage to fill up with petrol, but whilst at the petrol station, I managed to pick up the other bread items that we needed. Well, bread is one of the most basic food items, isn't it? Though if we haven't got any bread, we can manage on our own uh, with other things. In the first century, bread was a very basic food type. And that's why Jesus tells us, for example, to pray, give us each day our daily bread. Because we're praying then for our most basic physical need. Well, today's reading was of a time when there were a large group of people that all needed that most basic food type, bread. But there was none to go around. And this story teaches us about what we find in Jesus when we come to him. It's about more than just bread. Now, in one sense, coming to Jesus is a one-time thing. You only become a Christian once. Because to become a Christian is to recognise that Jesus gave his life for you so that you could give your life to following him forever. Maybe you're not yet a Christian. Well, Jesus is there for you to come to him and to follow him. He gave his life so that you could come to him. No one has been good enough to come to him. None of us could be. Instead, we trust in what he has done for us. We recognise that he did everything for us so that we could come to him. But then when we are Christians, we need to keep on coming to Jesus every day to renew our friendship with him. Because that's what it is to follow Jesus, is to spend the whole of your life with him. And so we need to be, need to be reminded of him each and every day of our lives. If you turn your Bible back one page to Matthew chapter 14, you'll spot a very similar story, a very similar miracle. In fact, a more famous miracle. Jesus has only just fed a crowd of 5,000 with bread and with fish. And now a short while later, he's feeding a slightly smaller crowd of 4,000 people. So why the repeat? Well, we'll come on to another reason later on. But perhaps one reason is because Jesus wanted to see if his followers had learnt the lessons from before when he fed 5,000 people. And it seems that they hadn't. So they needed to be reminded of who Jesus is and of what we find in him when we come to him. So whether we're coming to Jesus for the first time this morning, or whether we're coming to him as those who already follow him, what might we find when we do come to him? Well, one thing we do find in coming to Jesus is compassion. Compassion is when you see that someone is in a very needy situation and you're moved by it. You're concerned and grieved and you want to help. In fact, the word, uh, as it was used in the first century Greek, uh, means a moving in the bowels. So it's to be moved internally is what to have compassion is. And Jesus, in speaking to his disciples, he tells them that he's moved with compassion for this vast crowd of people. When you look at this crowd in the story, you can see that there was plenty of need for compassion. We learn about some of their needs before we get on to the topic of food. And in verse 30, there's a list of all the needs. So you've got people who couldn't walk, people who couldn't see, people who couldn't talk. And then there were many others as well. Now, in those days, disabilities were a lot more debilitating even than today. There was no disability benefit and no extra help for those who couldn't work. 
It was usually the case that those who were disabled became beggars on the streets. But Jesus heals them. And as he heals them, he's showing his compassion upon them. He recognises their great need. And because he has the power to meet those needs, so he meets those needs in the most incredible ways by healing them. Can you imagine what it must have been like to be blind or unable to walk, to have such a crippling condition, only to have someone to lift you back on your feet or to open your eyes? Can you imagine it? It's wonderful, isn't it? Well, the result is that they praise God. But then Jesus has even more compassion upon them. In fact, it's only after he's healed them that he tells his disciples that he has compassion for them. And this time it's for an even more basic need that they have for food. Jesus recognises that they haven't been uh, able to eat for a long time. They've been with him for three days. That's a long time to be without food, especially for us in the West, who whenever we're hungry, uh, we eat. Jesus has compassion upon them in their hunger as well as in their healing. And in him, they find this compassion. The same is true today, that we find compassion in Jesus. He knows all of our needs, even more so than we know ourselves. He knows what you've been struggling with this very week. He knows if it's been a challenging week for you as you cope with your circumstances, where it is getting bread or feeling alone or isolated, coping with the stress of homeschooling. Maybe you've been coping with a disability or with grief or with pain or with something else. Well, Jesus knows and Jesus cares. If you come to him, you'll find compassion. What's more, that compassion he shows to us, well, we can then show it to others as well. When we come across those in need in our world, we ought to be moved internally. We ought to feel a sense of compassion for them. At this time, there's plenty of opportunity, as there are so many who are sick, so many who are dying, so many who are isolated. Do we have compassion upon them? But there's something about this miracle as well as the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, that might ring with the sound of familiarity with a story in the first half of the Bible. And that shows us that in coming to Jesus, we also find provision. Just as Jesus didn't just have empty compassion to leave those who were sick in their sorry state, so when he has compassion on their empty tummies, he doesn't want to just wish them well and send them on their way. Instead, he feeds them. The story is very interesting, the way it unravels. His disciples are thinking the logistics when they say to him in verse 33, well, where could we get enough bread in this remote place to feed such a crowd? And they're right. It would have been impossible for them to get bread to buy for such a large crowd in, in a remote place. But remember how I said earlier that this was in some ways to see if they had learnt the lessons from the previous time with the feeding of the 5,000? Well, they clearly didn't, because otherwise they would have just turned to Jesus and said, well, you can provide them the bread. Well, Jesus then asks them, how many loaves do you have? The answer is seven, with a few small fish as well. Well, it's time to coordinate the crowd. They all sit down. Jesus thanks God for the meal, and then they distribute it. Jesus hands it to the disciples, they hand it on to the people. And verse 37 goes to show just how great this miracle was. It says, they all ate and were satisfied. Afterwards, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. So Jesus is able to provide, not just on a meagre level, but on an abundant level. Now, I'm usually the kind of person that will go out of my way to find the cheapest possible deal that I can. I want to spend the least amount of money on everything. Uh, so whether it's parking somewhere for free rather than paying for parking or buying something off eBay from Hong Kong rather than going to the local shops. Now, there's usually a downside, isn't there? When you go for free parking, you usually have to walk a long way to where you want to get or items from eBay, well, they often lack the quality and customer service that shops can ensure. 
But Jesus isn't like me. No expense spared with Jesus. Everyone eats plenty of bread and there are even seven basketfuls left over at the end. Isn't that amazing? I wonder if you're beginning to see or remember what story from the first half of the Bible this is like. They're in a remote place and someone miraculously gives them bread. Well, when God had freed his people from Egypt, he led them through the wilderness in a remote place. And whilst they were there, the people were hungry. And so God miraculously fed them bread from heaven. It was known as manna. And there was a little bit of meat to go along it with it as well. A little bit of quail. In doing that, God showed himself to be a God who provides for his people. And by Jesus working this miracle, he's saying the same kind of thing, that he is God who provides for his people. As great as our need is for daily food, we have an even greater need that God has provided for. And this we also find in coming to Jesus. In coming to Jesus, we find salvation. Do you remember the story of the feeding of the 5,000? Do you remember how many baskets of crumbs were collected up at the end? The answer is 12. Now, one reason why it is 12 is because that's how many baskets they happen to collect at the end. But I think it's also 12 because of an important point Jesus was making. 12 represents the ethnic people of God, the Israelites, as they were made up of 12 tribes. So when Jesus fed the 5,000, he was in a Jewish area and he was saying that he is doing what God has already done for his ethnic people before, for the Jews. Jesus is saying that just as God freed his people from slavery in Egypt and so gave them salvation, that is what he is doing now for his people, the Jews. In fact, the freedom from Egypt was only ever a, greater, a picture of the greater freedom that Jesus was eventually to bring. And that freedom is being free from our sin, free from the one who enslaves us in our sin, the devil. But that's the feeding of the 5,000. How many baskets were collected up in this case? The answer is seven. Seven is often called the perfect number. Seven is the day of completion, uh, the day of rest in creation. And therefore, seven is also the number of the new creation in the new heavens and earth in the future. Another difference between the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000 here is that Jesus is now not in a Jewish area. He's in a non-Jewish or Gentile area. So taking all of that into account, I think the message of the feeding of the 4,000 is that salvation is available not just to the ethnic Israelite, but for the whole world. In other words, anyone can come to Jesus and find salvation in him. And one day the complete people of God in Jesus will be gathered to him from across the world. It will pe be people from every language group, ethnicity and skin colour. It will be perfect and complete. Now, what that means is that anyone can come to Jesus and anyone can find salvation in him. Anyone can come to him and be freed from their sin and set free from the devil's claim upon us. In the book The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, Edmund is the boy who is a little bit naughty and he ends up on the side of the evil character. And that's the White Witch. But Aslan, the lion, the good character... Just as the White Witch was about to kill Edmund, well, Aslan launches a rescue and he brings Edmund back to his side. And so the White Witch goes and confronts Aslan. She points out that because he was a traitor, he belongs on her side. And for every act of treachery, she has the right to a kill. And that's the claim that the devil has upon us. Because of our treachery to God, we don't belong on God's side, but we belong on the side of the devil. We see that we belong on the devil's side, that we've committed treachery against God, in the way that we do things that are wrong, which we do every day. 
We see it in the way that we act selfishly. And haven't we seen a lot of that in our current crisis? We see that in the way that we simply ignore God and don't give him a second thought. And what's more, the devil has a right to a kill because of us and our sin. However, as the Aslan story goes on, so Aslan goes to the White Witch willingly and lets her take him. And she, he lets her even kill him. Aslan gave his life so that Edmund could receive his salvation. And that is a picture of how Jesus has secured our salvation. Though we belong to the devil, Jesus has set us free by giving his life in our place. As he died for our sin, so we have been set free. All that means that as we come to Jesus, we find in him not just compassion for our desperate situation of treachery against God, not just provision as Jesus provided uh, an opportunity for us to be free, but actual salvation in that he actually accomplishes our rescue for us by giving his life in our place. If you've not yet come to Jesus, why not accept that he died for you so that you could be free and forgiven and accepted by God? And you, if you are one of his followers, then don't we need reminding of this all the time? Don't we need reminding uh, of what he has done for us? Don't we need to be reminded every day of his compassion, provision and salvation? Well, we're going to sing one more song before I close in prayer. So let's sing our next song, I Once Was Lost in Darkest Night. <laughs>